Welcome to episode 37 of the Dealers Compressed podcast. My name is Paul J. Daly, and as you can see, I moved my office. I'm actually at the Driving Sales Executive Summit. This week it's in Las Vegas. The weather is warm and it's nice, but I can't wait to get home. I just love being home. But today we got to interview one of the keynote speakers at the event. His name is Ollie Gardner, and he is just, you can tell he thinks so fast he has a hard time keeping up like his mouth. And he has a company, he's co-founder of a company called Unbounce. And what they really do is measure behavior on websites and try to make them more connective. They try to make them more on brand. They try to make them more interactive, that convert better. And the science that they have around what you put on a call to action button or how you write your headline. I just, watching his keynote today, my mind was blown. And you know sometimes when you hear these really simple things and they seem like, oh, I should have thought of that or why didn't I think of that? Like in my mind, those are the best things because those are the things that weren't so obvious, but they're the easiest to execute. So in our interview today, he talks about some of those things. Um, we talk a little bit about why there are no green M&Ms in Canada. I don't understand. Um, I had to ask him the question, does he know the other Canadians that I know as if there's only 10 Canadians because that's what Americans do. We ask Canadians if they know the, the other Canadians that we know. And uh, so all in all, I hope you're able to learn a little bit from this. We have some practical tips. We're going to link them up in the comments below or in the email that you got so that hopefully you can have some deployable things that can just make you better because that's what we're about. Let's do some podcasts. Let's talk to some brilliant people and let's get better as a community. So I hope you enjoy this conversation with uh, actually before I do that, we have a second guest on the podcast today and I think you might recognize him, but it's pretty awesome. You're going to have to watch a little bit to see who it is, but he crushed it too. So we have two people that crushed it today. I'll let you see him. Hope you enjoy this interview with Ollie Gardner. Make sure recording. I've made that mistake once. <laughs> Halfway through an interview, and I'm like, oh. Can you give the same spontaneous reaction to all like, my questions hi. again? Maybe, well, first you try to play it off, but you're like, there's no way I can, I can play this one off. Like, it's not right. going to happen. So, Ali, thank you so much for giving us in the audience a little bit of time today. Um, I know you're, you're busy and you're running and gunning. And you just gave a fire keynote at Driving Sales Executive Summit. So thanks for being here. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. So I love your vibe when you talk about the need for brand differentiation, the need for storytelling. Um, but before I get into that, could you just give our audience like a couple minutes on what you do and why you do it? Sure. Well, uh, I'm co-founder of a software company called Unbounce based in Vancouver, Canada. Um, I've, I've worked in many different kind of roles. Like I started as a developer way back when, which was a terrible mistake. I was horribly <laughs> guided, misguided into doing that. Um, and I've moved gradually more to the creative side. Uh, as I've gone along and I've run usability teams for big gambling companies and you know, Vegas is perfect. Uh, and then that kind of set me up to really to get into optimization. Optimization and design, like coupling data and design, I guess, is what yeah. gives me the most kind of excitement. Yes. And also, I'm, I'm just generally pissed off at everything. It's a great <laughs> formula. That's a co-founder of the making right there. So yeah, I like to try and solve problems. Uh, I, I get a kick out of trying to solve problems. So the more bad marketing, the more bad advertising, more bad websites there are, the, the happier I am and the more I have to do. That's job security if I've ever heard it. <laughs> yeah. So um, today you talked about the need for dealers to differentiate themselves yeah. in a world where manufacturers are clamping down on regulations. Um, on this podcast, we talk a lot about brand clarity mm -hmm. and the fact that you need to own the customer loyalty because the manufacturer wants it, the third parties want it. Right. So, what is what is your thought and your angle on dealers building out their own identity? Yeah, the restrictions are tough in any kind of industry. Um, I think, and, and I don't know what all the limitations are, but whenever... I don't know if anybody does. Right. <laughs> until, well, you, until you violate one. Right, I'm, and I'm, maybe that's the best way to go, right? The whole ask for forgiveness rather than permission. Uh, because at the end of the day, if you're selling more cars for this manufacturer, you know, maybe they'll be okay with what yep. he did and maybe they'll roll out it somewhere else. It's really simple, really, that, that 
if you do a search for whatever it is you're doing, like mm -hmm. whether it, you're a, a Volvo dealership or whatever it is, yep. the simplest way to see if people are doing it wrong is to search and click on ads. Because the number of people, it's 90% plus mm -hmm. who do it wrong, mm -hmm. is, it, it's, it blows my mind. And the simplest thing they do wrong usually is sending an ad it's a very specific ad. They've written a very specific ad for a very specific purpose, maybe even a specific car, and then they send it to their homepage. The traffic, so like, oh yeah, a 2017 Jeep with, with that, and it's 28 grand, perfect. Click. Click on that, and like I showed my talk, well, there, there's three different cars that are not Jeeps, and none of them have that price, and now you're making me do the work. But it's such a disconnected experience, and you can't expect people to go through that. Do you think that people would, or you think you did just because you're pissed and you're curious? Uh, I do it for research purposes so I can right. get as many screenshots of bad experiences right. as I it's can. It's going to be one of the easiest jobs in the world. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because I started my talk with the parking ticket thing. Oh, it's amazing. And because I got two of these parking tickets, they're not cheap, they're 48 bucks each, but then when I got the second one, I was delighted because I didn't take screenshots the first time. <laughs> <laughs> right, because you probably only go through it if you have like a typic a citation number you have to put in there. Yeah, exactly. And it's only afterwards you're like, that was awful. So go back into it. But uh, yeah, I can guarantee whoever you are in this industry or any industry, most of your competitors are doing it wrong. Mm -hmm. So look at what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Look at your, look honestly at what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, whether it's as simple as changing the link in your ad to go to a very specific page that has the car you're talking about. Yep. That's this absolute It seems like thing common sense, but if you go out there right now, right, we could find a dozen of them very easily. Yeah, I imagine the first 20 you click on will do the, exactly that, that. It's terrible. When I started my career, well, I unbounced. My very first talk was 92% of landing pages suck. That was based on some initial research of doing a bunch of searches, clicking on 300 ads, and the fact that 92% of those drove people to a generic homepage that didn't, didn't deliver on the promise of the ad. That was nine years ago. It's still just as bad today. Still 92%. It's probably, it might be, it might be more, it worse, but it's that close. That would be unbelievable. <laughs> you have a really interesting way of, and, and I say interesting, um, it's very commonsensical the way that you make sense of a website and what you should and shouldn't do. You seem right. to be a little bit obsessive when it comes to measuring the call to action button. Um, talk about the importance of what's around that button. Yeah, it's, it's, I guess there's two parts there. There's what it says. Yep. Um, and what's sometimes what it's said around it. Mm -hmm. Because it's a very precious page element. You want people to click it. Well, so there's many design aspects. One of them being, and this is actually a competitor, the first competitor we ever had. They don't exist anymore. Uh, we scared them off. But they destroyed them. <laughs> but they did one of these classic A-B test case studies, which was green button versus red button. Mm -hmm. Just total bullshit. <laughs> there, there's like, and it was like, the red button won. The red button won because the website was green. And you couldn't could see, see the, the green, green button. button. It must be red. Let's right. make all the color. It was action nothing about red. the color. It was about the contrast of the color. Mm -hmm. That's why it stood out. And, you know, people say, oh, well, you know, we should have a blue button because Amazon tested it. No, no, Google tested it. Yeah, they tested it with like 300 million visitors to go through their 35 shades of blue, their, whatever their 50 shades of, <laughs> yes. 50 shades of button. Um, normal people, normal websites can't do that. You don't have that much traffic. What are some best practices? Like since we're, you know, we try to give a little bit of practical yep. advice on this. So I think call to action buttons is something we all struggle with. Anyone who's ever built out a web page, right? First you try to, you mentioned, you know, talk about trying to keep it clean, keep it simple, yep. keep it direct. And then like, there's this urge to want to put several call to action buttons. Yeah. Um, what are some best practices when deciding what to put, how many to put, where to put? Yeah. Um, if you're running a campaign, typically you have one goal, so you should only have one button. Unless it's a long page, you can repeat your call to action. That's fine. Mm -hmm. uh, throughout the page, just so it's present when people might be triggered by the content as mm -hmm. they're going down. But uh, same, same button. Or yeah, same the call same to action. one. Just keep repeating it. Um, but a, a good technique, like the first thing you shouldn't do is the word submit. Right, unless unless your business is like unless you're a dominatrix, and that's your service. Submit, press the button. <laughs> yeah, like so. Basically, and we've seen in research that saying submit mm -hmm. in general on your button doesn't always negatively impact conversion rate. Mm -hmm. 
often it'll have no, make no difference. But you are missing an opportunity for persuasion and for clarity. And a good place to start is to fill in the blank, answer the question or complete the sentence. I want to mm -hmm. blank. I want to download my ebook. I want to okay. start my free trial. I want to... Uh, so it's the continuation of the I want to sentence. Exactly, yeah. Just fill in that blank. And it's, it's a really simple way to start. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you have a starting place, then you have a testing a place to start testing makes from. Sense. So it, there, there really is an art and a science to it, and there's no silver bullet. Yeah, so unless you've done it based on things you've seen, like mm -hmm. a problem you've observed, yeah. you're usually just winging it and making it up, and it's hard to win a test when you're just throwing just throwing ideas right. out there. So especially the trying to be observe, objective about it. Yeah, well, that's another good point. One simple thing is to not have the person whose idea is set up the test. So it's an independent person. in Because they already have a perception of what they think is right, exactly. and they're inadvertently going to skew in yeah. that way. And then ideally, so the person running the test will then bring it to you once it's cooked. So like once it reaches significance, it's been like three or four weeks, mm -hmm. it's had enough conversions, lots of traffic, and the significance calculator, that's the second tool. Use a A-B test significance calculator, A-B test guide, Dot com. They have a great one. Okay, we'll link that up in, at the bottom. Yeah, you put in how much traffic you've got, you put in the conversions you got so far yep. for both variants, and it'll tell you whether it's significant or not. And it'll say, keep, keep going, yes. or it's okay to stop. You yep. have a winner. You have enough. Yeah, so then if you get to that helpful. point, then you should, in an ideal world, go to the people whose ideas it were, mm -hmm. it was, and present the, the, the result. The findings. Uh, and you go yes. like, B beat A. Awesome, we got a 20% lift. Whose was it? It was yours. Because okay. as long as you remove that bias, because bias kills tests, because people will, All like, day. Either they'll panic or they'll just say, woo, I'm winning, push yeah. it live. And that's really dangerous. I think that's really practical information. We'll link that site up at the okay. bottom. I think a lot of people, you got a question? Yeah. I told Patrick, if he, he's, he's very astute to the industry. So I was like, if you think of something, Jim. Patrick, you need to sit down and ask the question because the <laughs> microphone's here. Tag, you're at... No, you're in. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, okay, so your model is basically ADA on steroids, right? <laughs> Would you disagree with that? Uh, I, I, I'm okay with that statement. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, I mean, because you pay attention to where people are paying attention and yeah. the different things they're connecting with, and you reach a point of congruence, which yep. is funny because our creative agency is called Congruent. Okay. Um, so <laughs> we hit this point where we tell stories through creatively to help customers, you know, customers identify with the brand, right? Okay. So for example, we had a vendor who sells milk and they want to tell the story of a farmer and we go, your target demographic is moms. They don't care. Right. How does that fit into your model of te like when you're testing things, obviously you test different colors and, you know, different placements, but where does that fall into place when you start testing like, maybe you run this piece of content before this piece of content because it starts to fit better into the narrative. Right. Yes, you can get wins by just making up a bunch of shit, but unless you observe a real pain, you can't come up with a real plan to solve that and then you're kind of wasting your time. Like you're saying, if, if uh, you're making changes that aren't in line with your target demographic, it's, nobody's gonna notice and it's not gonna have any impact. Perhaps relevant to that is what you do after a test. Uh, whether it flatlines or whether it wins or loses, you have to dig deeper and look at what is the lifetime value. Uh, does this, because one thing you might suffer from, and this is kind of like the affiliate syndrome, is because affiliates, they want to get the conversion. They don't care who it is. They don't care what they do next. They just want someone converted, right? Then they cash in their money. Um, but you need to look further uh, to see what that person is doing. Do they have repeat purchases? Do they stick around? Do they have low churn? Because um, you can design for your ideal customer. That's one of the things I was talking about with just changing the, uh, the label on the email address field. You can get different kinds of uh, quality of email addresses just by asking for something. Uh, I did a test recently where I was testing a new trend. It's called a conversational form. Mm -hmm. Basically, you put a script on a page and it changes a regular form into a chat, right. basically, uh, which is a modern mechanism which might be in line with 
you know, say you have a millennial audience or something mm -hmm. uh, who are more familiar with these modern interaction modes, then that might be a good approach. But if you don't validate it, you can run into problems. So I ran this test because I wanted to see whether it was a good thing. And form versus conversational form, the conversion rate was identical, 8.3%. Wow. Then what people do is like, oh, it didn't win, throw it away, or it didn't lose, let's just put it live. Right. And that's really dangerous because, and this is what I mean by checking lifetime value or checking different things. With this one, the thing I was most concerned about was the quality of the leads because it was different, it was new, it might appear untrustworthy because it's like a chat bot. Right, it could just be spam exactly. or, or a bad plugin. Yeah, yeah, so I looked manually at all of the data afterwards, all of the leads, and there was a 72% increase in fake email addresses. Really? I imagine because people are like, eh, I'm just gonna put any old junk in here because I don't trust it. Right, you just want the answer. Exactly. Um, and I managed to fix that problem, but only because I observed that it was a problem. The way mm -hmm. I fixed it, it was for a landing page course. I said, which email address would you like us to send the course link to? Now they're like, oh, I have to give you a real email address because otherwise I'll never get let in. It wasn't true. As soon as you just submit the form, you get sent through. Right. But, <laughs> but it was you know, trying to leverage psychology to see if I could undo the problem that I had right. observed. But only because you wouldn't think of doing that unless you'd have observed that problem in the first place. It's really yeah. meta that you're you know, testing landing page for a <laughs> landing page optimization course. Yeah. Um, and actually, I'm really glad you touched on the lifetime value thing because one of the big things that we talk about with the agency is like, especially for the dealership model and differentiating mm -hmm. yourself is that you know, one sale or one conversion is one sale, but if you convert somebody to your brand and they start to identify yeah. with you, now they have a religion because they're going to trust you no matter what, whether it's sales, whether it's service, whether it's, you know, 10 years from now and you go, I had a really good experience there. I'm going to mm -hmm. trade in and buy something new. Um, so it's really interesting to look at the lifetime value yeah. as a such a big factor. Yeah. And we, I mean, because we're a software company, a SaaS product, we have a pricing page. Mm -hmm. um, so people are always trying to figure out, well, what's our, what should our pricing strategy be? How much should I price this at? And continuously over the last nine years, we've changed our pricing. We've raised our prices basically three times. Okay. And every time uh, you're afraid when you do it, you're like, oh, conversions are going to go down. Nah, it doesn't happen for the most part. Little dip sometimes. But the additional revenue from the higher price more than compensates for that. But also you find you get better customers. This is a way of designing for ideal, mm -hmm. getting your ideal customer. For us, we want professional marketers with a budget. We had this guy, we think he's in his 70s, he's called Lamar. He, would, he was on the $10 plan. He just wanted to get a page on the internet because his grandchildren thought he should. He wasn't a marketer and yeah. he, he would spend two hours on the phone with us every third day. I think he was lonely, <laughs> but you know. And he's he, the he, old guy who calls 911 just because he wants <laughs> someone to talk yeah. to. Exactly, so our support costs were going through the roof. So we raised, raised prices, our revenue went up, support burden went down, uh, because you're designing an experience that, it, that can attract or convert your ideal customer, not some, you need to price people out sometimes. Right, uh, well, I mean, that's, that's a big thing, I think, for you guys at least, is because it communicates very well, um, but also it appeals to, like, most marketers are generally, like, not super creative, but they're also not super artsy. They fall right. somewhere in the middle. They understand the way that different things function together and they're not gonna make the best looking thing, but they know like what they wanna change to make it work a little bit better. Yeah. Um, I think you guys do that perfectly, which is nothing, no follow up, <laughs> just really cool. <laughs> well, thank you, appreciate um, it. <laughs> so I got two more questions. I yeah. know we, we said short. So this is, oh, that's okay, what's do what you gotta on? do. Oh, I gotta find someone green M and M's request from someone. Can't get them in Canada. Really? <laughs> yeah. You can't get green M and M's in Canada. Uh, they do it like once in a blue moon, but what or the green heck? moon, but yeah. Why? No idea. I didn't know they existed. We need to find the answer to that. <laughs> Why they? You can't buy green M and M's in Canada. Yeah. Only red ones <laughs> and white ones. Okay, two questions left. Yeah. First question. You're giving somebody the best practices, and this is, I'm only, I'm gonna like refine you to like one paragraph. Okay. How should someone approach building a homepage? 
I know one paragraph is like, I'll give you four, I'll give you five <laughs> sentences and you'll probably go over. But if I'm approaching, and I know they're variables, yeah. right? So I'm asking you to think broadly, but succinctly. This is good at making you think. Probably the wrong time to make you think after like <laughs> time in Vegas and having yeah. to give a keynote. Now I'm asking you to put your thinking hat on. Uh, I would say that the single most important thing and the thing you should always start with is your value proposition. If because if you can't communicate, actually I'm going to explain the problem rather That's than fine. how to do it. But um, if you can't communicate quickly, your competitor will. So when you say quickly, what do you mean? So within a, the first few seconds, when someone arrives on your page and they look at it. If you were sitting next to them and you said, what is it we do? They could answer the question. It's really rare for that actually to be the case. Right. Uh, but you need to ask that question of people because usually the way we write our headlines, the headline on your homepage is because we're so attached to our own stuff. You know, we right. love the smell of our own shit. Right. So, <laughs> right. so we write what makes sense to us. Mm -hmm. Might not make sense to your target demographic. It might not make any sense at all. It might be convoluted and hard to understand. Um, this is not one paragraph. It's okay. Now I'm going to let you know. Uh, this is really good though. <laughs> no, it's because we talk about clarity a lot on this podcast. Right. And what you're saying right now is like you need clarity and clarity means short. And if I can't get it in under five seconds, then it's too complicated. Yeah. Cause the, what all your headline is doing is confirming that you have what people expect you to have, whether it's because they clicked on an ad or whatever it yeah. is. Um, and that makes them go, Oh, okay. And then they will spend time on the rest of your page. Yep. So you don't even have to have the rest of a page if you haven't got that figured out because no one's going to look at it. Right. Uh, and what I see often is, uh, from a clarity standpoint, there's your headline, but then your subhead. A subhead is designed to add clarity to your main statement, mm -hmm. but it shouldn't be the only thing that's clear. Mm -hmm. What I see a lot is a technique I like to call the headline flip. If you have a headline and a subhead, Run a five-second test where you, you know, people see your the above the fold experience for five yep. seconds. Ask them what does this company sell? What does this product do? Very easy test to run. Really easy, and you can do it with a stranger on the street. You show yeah, you them. You could print it out, right? Yeah, and you just go look at this five seconds. Da -da 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 -da. What does that company sell? I love that. So do that, and then do it and flip the order of your headline and subhead. Because a lot of people write the headline trying to be clever right. or sexy. Yeah. And without the subhead, it doesn't make much. It's, it's, it ends it up being generic. It needs the subhead to describe. So yeah. what happens when you flip it? Often you'll get people uh, will understand it way quicker. And I'm not saying you should just flip it and leave it. Right. But if you flip it and you get a better result in terms of more people understanding it. It informs you that the language in the subhead is, is more direct. Yeah. So then work at bringing that, that in. That's a really headline. practical tip. Okay. Mm -hmm. So... I'm going to give you another paragraph okay. since that was one. <laughs> he writes a lot of run-on sentences. So, <laughs> The heading, subhead. Mm -hmm. Clarity so that people can understand five seconds, five second test. Yep. It's the next most important thing on a homepage. Hmm. If you could only have two things, what would be the second one? Uh, interesting. A testimonial, a social proof by someone or something that matters. Okay. Something that people will a person they'll recognize or just something that's so clearly truthful mm -hmm. and benefit driven mm -hmm. that they go, huh, okay, yeah, yeah. I get that. Sure, uh, and that could, that could actually be a lot of things. Yeah. So it could be a famous person, it could be a photo yeah. that is, you can't fake. Yeah. But it's, it's getting them so they're gonna understand what you're about and they're gonna see some third party proof verification yeah. that's like, oh, they actually are that. And just like your headline is often people's headlines are loaded with hyperbole mm -hmm. because they're just, you know, they fall into the gray goose effect. We're like, we're the world's number one this. I saw uh, this, there was this website I was critiquing and are all there they any did, other kind? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all the way through, uh, like, okay, I call this the bullshit test. Uh, basically, if you take uh, a printout of your homepage, mm -hmm. go up to someone, can be anyone, family member or something, ideally someone who doesn't know what you do, mm -hmm. and re scan your page, because that's what people do, mm -hmm. read out all of the headlines and subheads throughout mm -hmm. the page. Uh, so each section usually has a headline. Read them out and then ask people what you do. You might get a lot of like, oh, I have no idea because 
we tend to, to bloat these statements mm -hmm. with things about why we're special. Like number one, this one example was number one marketing platform, trademark. That was their headline. <laughs> and, and there Just was nothing case. that actually <laughs> said what they do why? anywhere on the page. What? And, and, and like if, you, if you, you really are and you've trademarked that, what happens if a competitor takes you? Now you're going to trademark number two marketing platform? I don't know. It's <laughs> right, right. No, I understand. I understand. So hype is a big problem in headlines, but also in testimonials. People, like I was critiquing a photography course. I'm a photographer, so I was really interested in this. Mm -hmm. And the testimonials, there are four of them. Uh, all of the, the photos, none of them were holding a camera. So I'm immediately going, uh... Do they actually Yeah, are these photos? actual photographers? <laughs> and then there were, the, the testimonials said things like, uh, reaching out to Megan is the greatest thing I've ever done. No, it's not. Megan changed my life. No, she didn't. This is not Baywatch, and this is not like some <laughs> reawakening. It's a photography course. Um, but I researched them, and all of them were legit photographers, and they were all very good. But it smacked of BS yeah. because there was too much hype, and they were making it too ridiculous yeah. so i the reason i have that testimonial equation in my talk mm -hmm. was because i reverse engineered a whole bunch of really good testimonials i have a testimonial equation yeah uh, i used to re reverse engineer it and those questions allow you to build something that so in this case i would have a photo of someone with a camera yeah and it would be very specific and transformative so specifically the example i give was after taking lesson number two about graduated neutral density filters, I no long, I'm no longer running around panicking at the end of the day, trying to balance the foreground with, uh, with the sky. That's perfect. Yeah, but after this, Specific. I get three times as many great shots uh, using this technique, and then show a before and after photo that illustrates that perfectly. I believe it because it's so specific. Yeah, right, they know what they're talking about. Here's yeah. proof, mm -hmm. right, people like me. Yeah. That's, all right, so. I think that's really good stuff. Can you, do you have that equation? Like, could you send that yeah. to us or give it so we could yeah. post it? So people, I would love to share that. Yep. Last question. This is an easy one. Not such a hard one. You're all through all the hard work. <laughs> no math questions. Um, who are the type of people that, and this is about your services that you offer at Unbounce. Okay. Right. So who are the type of people that you think would benefit best from connecting with you? And how can they connect with you? Typically, uh, the people who, you know, any marketer needs a landing page, but typically it's uh, in-house marketing teams mm -hmm. and agencies are mm -hmm. our kind of most successful customers. Mm -hmm. um, Twitter is the fastest way to get in touch with me. Okay, we'll link uh, it up. Ollie Gardner, and you know what? I'm very open, transparent, so ollieatunbounce.com, you can email me. That's, yeah, dead easy. That's it, so we'll link it up. Thank you so much for sharing with My our pleasure. audience today. Um, I hope that we have better websites and maybe <laughs> we'll go from 92% to 91% as a result of this That'd podcast. Thank you very much. <laughs> Cheers. So I hope you enjoyed that interview. Ali is just kind of from another world, the way he thinks and puts things together. I don't know how he does it. Um, thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. We have some other great interviews coming up. And uh, so we're being really lucky with interviews. Um, I hope you will follow us along on our socials. Link us below. I know everyone isn't on every channel. Every channel has a different flavor. So if you follow you know, my Twitter or my Instagram, um, you're going to get a different thing. Connect with me on LinkedIn if you're professional. There's a lot of great stuff going on there. And instead of closing out of this podcast myself, I'm going to have Patrick close it out. Um, thank you for watching the Dealers Compressed podcast. My name is not Paul J. Daly. Clarity. Say, people!